Hello and welcome to Glaswegian Geeks. Today we are covering a fairly recent movie that's just been out in the cinema last week. James, it is so alien to me. Fucking get me out. Alien Covenant, yes. Um, we're taking another trip into the land of the Xenomorphs. And David. <laughs> Slash Walter. Slash Walter. I mean, yeah. The sequel to Prometheus. We're kind of taking a little trip, really. It was a bit... I mean, the film is a bit strange. Should also say spoilers are going to be in this because it's not out in America yet. <laughs> spoilers are going to be in this. If you, d- if you don't want to see the film because you didn't like Prometheus, then we will tell you everything that's yeah. going to happen. Uh, but Chris is here, and Hello. he's going to be telling you <laughs> why some you really should have bo- liked it. <laughs> some boring random facts about Alien. He's, he's going to tell you why Prometheus was a good film. It was such a good film. <laughs> and Mario... What's your stance? Prometheus is an abomination that you see at the end of Alien Resurrection. What? I did not know that Ooh. that was his view of it. This is going to be great. And in the blue corner, we have Mario, all-time hater of everything. And in the red corner, we have the goddess of horror himself, Chris. I'm physically taking a bow. No, you're not. You're sitting down. I bowed with my hand. Okay. <laughs> that was a very that was a bow. That was very royal. Very royal loyal. slash camp king is in the house but yeah so we're going to be talking about alien covenant the sequel to prometheus the part prequel to yeah. alien yeah because yeah. there's still a, another sequel there's still one more to come which will be the official prequel but these three films are effectively prequels to the alien films what, what would you call a trilogy equal trilogy equal a pre-trilogy or just go with prequel prequels i'll tell you, I'll tell you what you call a pre a pre-trilogy star wars <laughs> yeah so, depending on what your stance in these films are, good or bad, I think it's really just down to your interpretation. We all know that the Alien films and the Prometheus films, is what I'm going to call them, are very different to each other. Prometheus is more about the origin. It's a more story-based experience. And it does have its action, but it's a more story-based experience. And Alien is just, just straight-up horror and we're killing aliens sort of thing. Yeah, it's horror, action hybrid like an alien almost uh what i want to get into right away alien covenant is one of the best movies from this franchise yes i I, I would rate it maybe third favorite okay i would have my personal choice aliens alien then this with other things (laughs) And 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 a big jambalaya of like fourth shit place. But we all agree that Alien versus Predator is not part of. Oh, this. is it fuck canon? Good, that's yeah, fine. Well, of course it's not canon. No, I don't. I mean, <laughs> if you want to talk about the age-old question, who's going to win a fight out of an alien and a predator? I'm getting pissed. Sick of people saying predators are just always going to win. I mean, to be fair, they're mere kitty too. True. But in the other aspect, aliens blow up acid pretty much. So yeah. Should be Ripley versus Predators. Now that's a film I'd watch. Ripley versus any alien ever. Just in general, <laughs> like illegal aliens. Yeah. Like she works, gets a job for Donald Trump. <laughs> she's and about just yeah. She's, she's like about like dog the bounty hunter. <laughs> that, she's the Ripley dog the, the bounty, bounty hunter. <laughs> that that I would watch. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> but but in this film, can Kurt Russell be the president? No. I want Kurt Russell to be president. No. The evil Morgan bastard. Freeman is always the president. I know, but Donald Trump's a bastard, and Kurt Russell can play a bastard. But not that much of a bastard. <laughs> Fair play. So, Alien Covenant is, is a sequel to that shit. Prometheus? But you have to acknowledge but Prometheus. I, w- I would like to uh, strike from the record that Prometheus did not happen in the the little flashbacks that we see in the movie are little flashbacks okay. that, uh, that we do not need what did to be referred what did you to not as like from another about movie. Prometheus? That would be the easiest way to okay, access uh, this. Okay, I could make it easier and tell you what I liked about it. Okay. Which is not much. But there must be a reason why you didn't like Prometheus. Uh, the Hold on. I'm David. I'm going to inject this black goo into this guy. He's going to pump his bird. She's going to get prego with this giant alien. She's going to cut it out. And then this big rolling ship's going to keep on rolling. Charlie's Theron's not going to run to the fucking side like a stupid fucking bitch. She runs on forward. She runs on forward. 
that's what you didn't like about Prometheus. <laughs> There's many other things, but that's a that's a high points. Was it the story? Was it the lack of action? No, I actually really loved the story and the lack of action didn't really do anything bad to this because Alien itself didn't have a lot of action. It had a couple chase scenes in the ship, uh, a couple jump scares and stuff. But other than that, it's it's one of my favourite movies. Prometheus tried to channel that and it failed miserably. Mm. I th- I think the what Prometheus what the problem with people's opinion of Prometheus is is that they associate it too much with the alien films. And I think you have to look almost to Prometheus being a standalone film and then obviously Covenant and then whatever's coming next is the bridges that are taking you towards the alien films. I think Prometheus as take if someone had told me that wasn't about Alien, I still would love it. I thought it was a really good film. I think it's a really good film about faith and lack of faith. It's this idea of creation. It brings in a lot of quite heavy topics. And it is a very talky film. I think Charlize Theron is amazing in it though. I think Michael Fassbender is amazing in it. I just think it, it, yeah, it's slow, and I can see why people don't like it. I just kind of love it. I just think it really works well. It's a really good sci-fi film. Here's the thing. I don't rate it. Um, I'd probably even rate Alien Resurrection above it. <gasps> that is sacrilege. Like, that. that's how bad With Nona Ryder. With Nona Ryder. I know. I know. That That is how bad it's, it's, it is in my books, to be honest. If I can chime in here, I don't think Prometheus is that <laughs> bad. Like... <coughs> like Chris is saying, Prometheus is about being a, the creator. That's what David's. That's what the flaw in David's system is. David doesn't understand the point of. He was created artificially, and he wants to create. He wants to be God. He wants to be above yeah. everyone else. It's like they've given him ego. It's that idea that. He's not the perfect android because they've given him some form of ego. He's got ego about who he is. And then, but even the whole opening sequence with the engineers and stuff like that, it does. I mean, it takes a lot to explain what's going on. And they don't really explain what goes on a lot in Prometheus. You kind of have to kind of deduce a lot what's going on. And I do think that is a flaw. I always defend Prometheus by talking about the stuff they deleted from Prometheus, which is I always still see it. And it's good, and I think it's brilliant, and I think they explain a lot more. There's a bit more of Alien Origins in it as well, the deleted stuff. But I think it just really does stand alone. Again, I we talked about this earlier, I'm not a big fan of Shaw's character at first, but once she kind of gives herself that kind of, you know, homemade abortion and then kind of takes on the thing, it becomes really good, and she you begin to like her. I like the fact that she still keeps her faith at the end of it. Um after like you know her father was a minister and stuff like that and died of ebola and i don't know if i know all that just by accident or that was just me but that is in the film i'm not making that up uh so she's kind of created this whole thing and then she she always has faith she does this whole thing at a blind faith uh and that's why i liked her character towards the end uh of the film again it doesn't answer any questions towards the alien franchise which i think a lot of people were expecting because not everyone knew at the time it was going to be a trilogy. So it's that way that it was a slow pace. And I think Covenant does everything right by it. But I still think Covenant is a very much good companion piece to Prometheus. Well, you've raised some very good points there. But how about we dive into the story very briefly on Alien Covenant. As James has said, it's not out in the US. But there will be spoilers in this. So if you do not want to know anything about it, wait until you've seen it first and then cause just don't come to us and fucking complain, alright? Now that you have been warned, <coughs> say after, so, you know, Prom- um, Prometheus happened so many years before COVID. Ten years. Ten years. And in those ten years, we don't really know what's happened to Shaw and David until the Covenant finds themselves on this planet uh, which, you know, realistically, I'm going to skip the whole actual intro bit because the whole intro bit is irrelevant. Uh, not re- irrelevant. The characters wake up. Some of them die. 
they decide that instead of going back into cryostasis, they're going to go to this other planet that spontaneously. I think appears. you should explain what they're doing, though. They're they're basically okay, they're, creating they're looking to recolonize. Yeah, it's on a, a colony ship. Planet. They've got uh, there's a crew of like twelve people, and then there's two thousand frozen people and embryos as well because they're going to colonize this planet that they've found that would take seven years to get to. That's I think going. I would go with that just because you think they're not just on a spaceship, <laughs> like they're well, just casually in space and they're uh, looking for a space planet. Cause fuck it. Yeah. But okay, yeah. So you know they're going to a new planet to colonize, but it's going to take them another. So basically, a uh, solar flare storm hits the ship. Yeah. It's hits the ship and damages the ship, which wakes the crew up. The initial crew up. Walter, who is also played by Michael Fassbender, who yes. is a an upgraded model of, of David. David. He's American this time. Yeah, he is American. Is that an upgrade? <laughs> so, ooh. Controversial. <laughs> Downgrade. Right. So, yeah. He, Walter effectively tries to fix the ship, gets the crew up. James Franco dies. Yeah, they lose their captain, so they have to have a new captain. James Franco being your captain, like I'm sure he was very good in that. <laughs> um, he climbed. He seemed to climb that mountain really well in that video, so I'm sure he did really well. Yeah, I suppose he did. I suppose he worked hard. But yeah, um, effectively, what ends up happening is the crew wake up and the new captain is sort of in charge. And some th- as they're fixing the ship when they go back in, they find that there is actually another colonizable planet not actually as far from them. Did you see the film? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they get the signal. Yeah, they get the, yeah, the signal, signal which signal? is someone speaking to them. Yeah. And then they find out where and it's from. And it turns from. out that it's a... Uh, Tennessee says it's a song. It is. It's a John Denver song. Rome, yeah. To the place so where they, I belong. So they find <laughs> the location and go to it because it's yeah. near. It's, too, it's like a week away or something. So they go there instead. But then it, they think that we could colonise here and then that's it. Yeah, and then they get there. Yeah, and then they get there. The now we can go to the actual action. <laughs> the thing you'd get. Yeah, the main thing coming from this is the acting captain now is a man of faith. And don't, he's trust, don't trust religious people. That is the main theme of that film. Yeah. Don't. Well, the first one especially. Like, yeah. You know, as we will get into. Man of God, man of fraud. That's all I'm ah. going to say. <laughs> I like that. I'll keep that. Uh, yeah, so our acting captain has the crew land and has them explore and test the water and vegetation and stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it all goes Pete Tong. Quite quickly the, the as black, well. The black yeah. goo that was heavily featured in the first ship, uh, the first film, that abomination, uh, has, well, you can kind of see yeah. that it's almost evolved over the time and it's went into the vegetation and is basically co- oh you could almost say colonized and yeah. infiltrated like a the ve- yeah they created a fungi out of it and it spores once you touch it which i really did like yeah it was the amazing. little like going into the ear and then we're kind of working we're its way in. your body yeah it's that the idea that when it goes in the person's ear it will come out their back or if it goes in through your nose or your mouth it will come in through your chest it kind of finds its location which is quite smart um yeah and then again mayhem ensues yeah what want to touch on the the aliens that you see in the trailers and stuff is these kind of spore spore born you know so it's very different from what you're used to is what they're called what are they called neomorphs neomorphs that's their official name Mm, that's their fancy ones yeah i know their official name uh well something that they are that the previous aliens that are in the future movies they are born to fight and kill straight up straight away as soon as they're born as well yeah, straight up, as soon as they find their way out of your body, they're they come out quite something. large as well. It's not like the normal chest buster. Yeah, no, definitely. They actually come out as fully fledged. Genuinely fully fledged mini xenomorphs. With no eyes. With no eyes. Not that the aliens do have eyes, but it's a very smooth. Yeah. They don't seem to have yeah. a mouth as well until the la- till you don't want to see that mouth. Yeah, I mean, I think I think I really like about this film is you see a kind of subtle evolution. You see the the initial babies, you know, yeah. 
and then you see one that has grown up a bit. Yeah. And then you see... You see your face hugger and the then you see the yeah, chest buster and, and then you see your actual xenomorph. Your actual xenomorph that we all know and love near the sort of end. So, yeah, I mean, effectively when mayhem ensues and a few characters die... A few? Quite a lot of <laughs> quite characters a lot. die. <laughs> quite a lot of characters die. We're introduced once again to David, who has been reassembled effectively, who we can only assume by Shaw. Yes. And, and has a very fancy cloak. And looked a bit very Assassin's Creed. Was that just me? I know he played Assassin's Creed. I know that's not the name of the character. Like Die Hard. Yeah. But it's yeah. Maybe it was one of those those ones they had the prop left over and he went, you know what? I could use it in this movie. And has really big feet. Did anyone else notice he has really big feet? Well, apparently he's got a bit Well, a no, big he does. He does. I've seen Shame, but it's... Uh, <laughs> He does, uh, but he's got really big feet. I was like, I kept looking at his feet constantly, going, "Those feet are big." I mean, you know what they say: big feet, big socks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think about Michael Fassbender right now. <laughs> I, I just can't. Aspender. Yeah. Oh shit! You fucking stole it. <laughs> Michael Aspender. And yes. you second name kind of sounds like that as well. Well, there's all links here. Aspender. Aspender. <laughs> <laughs> this is like just bullying now. Can we just, can we just yeah, bully you? Yeah, actually, fuck or off, you two, right? Okay, on to the subject. <coughs> David. Yes. Yes, he's... He's still David. He's still a dick, to be quite honest. Um, is he? Mm. Is he not just reacting? He's kind of got father issues, to be fair. Yeah, like... You do kind of feel a little bit more sorry for him, even though you've witnessed him just oh, annihilate like, all the engineers. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. God forgot about that. Yeah, he annihilates the whole engineer planet with the virus, uh, and he kind of tells a story that you kind of know is not true about um, putting Shaw to cryo sleep and she died in the crash and stuff like that. And you know deep down that's not what it is. There's a very undertone of menace about him straight away. Um, and he's now t- inhabiting this entire planet on his own, pretty much. I think, I mean, you hear quite a few arguments of people saying that David, you know, can be quite, not relatable, but understood because of why he does what he does. And I, I don't I, I don't really buy it. I mean, I think David is a character who, even though he's been ar- artificially made as a synthetic, he knows what he's doing. And he's only out for his own personal gain. And I think that's always been his intention since Prometheus. I think he realises... Well, he knows that he's smarter than his creator. And he's basically created to serve. And especially in that opening sequence, the whole way when he challenges Wayland, and then Wayland basically just says, bring me my tea, like that, because he basically puts him in his place. And I think that's where, that's where it all comes from, that... David and kind of I f- completely forget Charlie Theron's character's name now, uh, but her character as well in Prometheus because that was uh, Wayland's daughter as well. So they were brother and sister, and they both were very cold and android-like. And it was that idea that obviously she was human. So it's this way that I think they were both very mistreated as children and had to they didn't really earn their their dad's love. So it's that way that his way of reacting is almost how Wayland would do it. It's this kind of cold, calculated very much wants to end mankind because basically mankind has had their chance in his opinion and they've screwed it up so the idea of them colonizing anywhere is not what he wants he basically thinks if your time's up your time's up it's time to evolve so he's very much of the, he kind of almost takes the engineer stance because yeah. it's the idea that that's what the engineers are there for but he's destroyed the engineers and basically taken on their own like their theology and he wants to basically end mankind and see what happens yeah and his way of doing it, effectively, is to encourage the xenomorph, basically. That's to play gods. That's Even though he's a creationist, he, he's playing gods. Yeah. So it kind of contradicts himself and what he's doing. But when you see his kind of basement of horrors uh, towards the end and you realise what he's been doing and what he's been creating, uh, he's been going through the different phases of evolution with for 10 years and basically has created the hybrids of what the facehugger is and the egg and basically introduces it to the man of faith and uses his faith to trick him as well, which is kind of the thing that's kind of, yeah, he understands he can get him to look into that egg uh, because of his faith. Mm-hmm. And then obviously that then brings our actual 
because you know more of TM into it as well. Yeah. <coughs> so effectively, after meeting David, and David, you know, takes the man of faith, the captain, and basically gets a face hug at the. To do what it does best. Do what it does best. Yeah. Latch onto your face and impregnate you. Weirdly. Yeah, impregnate you. Impregnate you. Everyone likes a good face, fucking James. <laughs> Fuck off, Mario. <laughs> Christ, I'm going to tell your missus. Anyway, so she yeah. Probably know, she probably knows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So, uh, with Michael Fassbender, we get possibly one of the funniest lines of the movie as well. For all the seriousness of the movie, there is a very... I was going to say tongue in cheek, but you know that's m- maybe what they're aiming for. Yeah. Uh, Chris, do you want to take that away? Well, it's all to do with a very beautiful moment with the recorder, uh, made out of. I wasn't too sure what was the recorder made out of. I would really confuse me anyway. But yeah, he's teaching Walter how to be artistic because Walter doesn't have the capacity to be artistic, but David believes that he has the capacity and wants to show him. So he teaches him how to play the recorder, and as he gets Dave, uh, Walter to blow into it, he does say the line, uh, will you blow into the little hole, I'll finger. I'll, I'll do the fingering. Which is, to be fair, we sat in the same cinema and nobody seemed to laugh at it. As, as I, 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 I chuckled I inside. I was I just like, chuckle. why is no one laughing? Yeah. I'm telling you right now, I did not chuckle inside. I let out a laugh. like because, And a film that's this serious and hasn't actually got that much humour when you hear a line like that, maybe it's just me acting like a child, but it was just so misplaced. But Just your mind. Uh, uh, yeah, but, come on. Blow into the little hole and I'll do the fingering. Depends how little the hole is. I just don't know why. I, I, to me, it just it was just funny. I'm sorry. Right? It, no, it was funny. I mean, I laughed. It was, it was yeah, it took you out of that moment. Yeah, it was supposed to be a, a strange moment and yeah, it took you out of it for a second. But, yeah, yeah which, to be fair, in those 10 years, David has become a little bit unhinged, I would say. <laughs> well, he was unhinged before that. Yeah, he's right? become he a little bit more moderately unhinged. Yeah, okay, I'll grant you that. In these sort of scenes to come, I mean, a lot of the film is basically, you know, them and David's home. Yes. And slowly trying to get in touch with the Covenant so that the Covenant can yes, come down and get, get them. Out. But meanwhile, they're kind of losing them one by one, uh, crew-wise. Because, again, they do that classic thing going, you go outside and you go upstairs and you go do that. They do split up and do the kind of the very tropes that these films have to do. But um, And also in that time, they're f- they're hiding from two neomorphs as well because there's neomorphs running about that have been created out of killing the two crew. So that's what they're hiding from before the revelation of the xenomorph that comes out of the captain um so then there's three no because they shoot one there's two again yeah so yeah you know the the traditional horror tropes are there people die one by one they eventually get through to the covenant and the quite covenant. gory this time this is actually quite a gory yeah, film actually cause it, it was it up the ante on its gore uh which worked really well for it but also i think slightly hindered it because the alien films aren't known for being gory and it's that way that the gore was quite excessive i think for certain scenes i kind of felt that they had to up their ante to maybe draw people back. Yeah, you know? definitely. It was. A, it was. Some bits were like an apology for Prometheus a wee bit. Thank you for. Uh, but I that also up there. know. But I uh, people are saying that, and I know people are reviewing it, and they're saying this film is an apology for Prometheus. But I was like, how can it be an apology for Prometheus when the film is a straight up sequel to Prometheus, and a uses the Prometheus score throughout, it and brings back huge characters from it as well and then you kind of think it's not apologizing at all it's basically saying do you want to see a wee bit of an alien do you want to see a wee bit of gore we'll tuck it in at the end here it is this is what you really want here's your num nums pretty much that's pretty much it but it works well for it it's better than that horrible tag along bit that's at the end of the prometheus which i'll give you when you kind of see the strange headed one that comes out that is completely tagged on and then you can tell that was tagged on uh just a piece to some people to have a link to it but it was quite gory, especially. I felt like I saw that woman's head quite a lot. Yeah, they kept on kept cutting back, back to, it. to it. It's like, oh wait, there her heads there. Oh, it's oh wait, there are bodies there. But oh, hold on, did you see her head? It did it four times. It cut to it four times, and you're like, right, we get it. She's got no head. We're fine with that now. You know, funnily enough, when I was watching it, I knew that she'd been 
decapitated. Headed. But She'd been see, headed. But see, every time it cut back, I was like, is there something wrong with her head? Yeah, it did it's been concentrate beheaded. on her head. Like, but, but I know why it was done. It was done because, like you say, they're trying to bring people back. They want to emphasise how yeah. gory that they're, they're trying to make it. And if this is how gory this film is, its sequel is going to be... It has to be a bit gorier, yeah. Much worse, you know. It's it's not even subtle. It's like she was literally beheaded. <laughs> like it's it's. I think it chewed through her neck mm-hmm. because she had a big bite in her shoulder, and also her stomach was bit bitten out as well. Um, yeah, because even those bits, and again, not a lot of people die at the hands of the Neo and the Xenomorphs, but when they do, it's completely. It I mean, pushes it. Just after that scene, you know, you've got the the bit where David actually talks. To Neil yeah. Moff, you know, he's trying to play that God figure, like, in, you know, saying, oh, it's beautiful, and then, you know, Captain comes in and shoots it, and David loses his shit. Like, but see, right, well, I was thinking of that, and I was thinking about that after I saw it. Is it to the point where David now has convinced himself that he's human? Because David must have known that the reason why that neomorph don't react to him is because he's synthetic so i'm kind of thinking is this kind of not a a link to blade runner but this idea that these androids are then they're believing that they're human after like he's kind of gone insane and he believes that he's human so he believes that the reason why that neomorph isn't reacting to him is because he has control over it but the neomorph isn't reacting to him because he's not real that's the whole reason why that's the reason why the egg won't open in front of him as well then that wouldn't explain the scene with walter true because, because it's almost like he slips in and out of it he like thinks yeah. that from one moment he acknowledges that he's he's synthetic and then other moments he seems to have the ego of a man it's like it kind of goes back and forth i think the thing with david is that he like we said i think david i think the whole point of prometheus was david believing that he could be a god yeah and then covenant is him a certain that he can be a god you know yeah because you know he is he's preserving the aliens he wants the xenomorphs and he wants them to yeah. destroy humanity you know? he's enjoying creating and i think maybe when the xenomorphs and the neonomorph don't attack him he feels that that's because he's his godly master, status yeah. you know these things look up to him yeah and i think that's where he is a bit confused but it's 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 a, it's a bit strange how they they're going about it. This is the thing about David. He's a he's an interesting character because we know his goal. We know he wants to destroy humanity, but at the same time, he wants to protect the xenomorphs, like they're his children. Yeah, I think he's just excited for change. What comes after, whatever will come after the end of humanity. He doesn't understand humanity. He doesn't understand Shaw's love for him. That Shaw develops a love for him, and he doesn't understand it. So he portrays it as love himself. But it's not because it's basically he only respected her because she was nice to him. And it's the same at the end when he reacts to Daniels. He kind of reacts like a physical partner towards her. Uh, He seems to like fight in people uh, because I don't think it's what he's used to seeing people fighting back. Uh, But at the end of the day, it's like he just, he seems to like, yeah, he confuses. He doesn't seem to like how people react to him, but he, like Daniels, and Shaw, he seems to link together and that's kind of weird because they seem to have respect. Because Daniel's love for Walter, I think it's that way that he kind of, he almost wants that as well. He's jealous of it because that idea that when he says to him, you really would do anything for her. Touching on uh, what you said there about Shaw, uh, in this movie they tie off almost the kind of like three, four pieces that was left over from Prometheus. One, David. Two, engineers. Which explains why they've never been seen in any other alien movies or anything else, so that's perfect. The last part, in which was teased at, was Shaw. And in the f- closing stages on the planet, we actually find out her fate, which is... Well, we kind of all guessed yeah. that it was led down this way. David doing experimentations on her and her line opened up on a table. Yeah. Pretty fucking gruesome and also shows that David is maybe beyond 
redemption at this point. I think it's this idea that he's he's opened her up to the point where he's looking at her physiologically as a woman and breeding and what they can do and stuff like that. But I also think it's linking, and we were kind of chatting about this earlier, that I think it's linking quite heavily that Shaw is the original alien queen. Yeah. That he's developing something out of that. Um, because he did say, I mean, David does say to Daniels, yeah. is it when he's actually fighting her? I was like, I made her something beautiful. Yeah. And the only thing, he th- he finds the Ninomorphs and the Xenomorphs beautiful. Yeah. What could he possibly find more beautiful? The Queen. Yeah. You know, and I think that's what his end game is. I think that's effectively he he will lead up to the the finite sort of alien and aliens. Yeah. Queen. Which uh, actually, now you say it, kind of ties in nicely with the closing stages where David brings up those kind of face hugger embryos yeah. you know like where did they get them from because that is kind of like maybe maybe high tech or biological but to keep them in such a state where do they get them from so that's actually a good point that yeah you because that. you and the, if they're following the mythology properly i mean we were again chatting about this earlier on the alien 3 has this mythology that they never quite see i think you, i don't know if they put it back into the other cuts the the face hugger that impregnated ripley it's a different type of face hugger the queen ha- face hugger has a very different type it's got jagged at the back it's protected almost it's heavy it's darker looking and i get the feeling that they're bringing that into uh the idea that there's this kind of these are the queen kind of face huggers and it's going to kind of create he's got obviously got all these bodies at the end of the ship and all these embryos to play with so he can do whatever he wants now and basically something has to be on that ship to lay in all these eggs to take you into alien so it's kind of clearly building up to that uh, so it has to be they have, they have to be they have to bring in the queen even though the queen isn't part of the the original alien something has to have laid these eggs so they have to bring this in well something uh when i came out from this movie something my friend said which i actually never knew about alien once the alien kind of secretes its kind of goop on you and kind of like almost turns you into like a husk, that that is what the original egg was. It was it was from a body, mm-hmm. which maybe that's what they're going for. That's how they got all these eggs. Yeah, yeah. It's it's hard to say because it still leaves a lot of questions up in the air but they're kind of good questions this time it's not like prometheus is it's like a constant joke that i always say that if something i don't understand i always say it has more questions than prometheus and it's that way that it's it's left a lot more open questions that you're kind of thinking where are they going to go next with this uh questions that you can you can kind of see now where it's going yeah and that's kind of because prometheus obviously is first part of our trilogy you're like well you weren't too sure where it was going to go with it um but I, I think, again, it goes really... I think it's a really great companion piece. I think it is a sequel. Alien Covenant is a sequel to Prometheus. It's hands down a sequel. Yeah. You can't say it's like, oh, they're just forgetting everything and starting again. It's not at all. It's like, it's slow. It's a slow build uh, Covenant, and it's worth it as well. It's an amazing... I think if you... I think if Prometheus, right, wasn't tied to the Alien franchise, right, people would maybe look at it differently. Yeah. Prometheus just wasn't what people who like Alien were expecting from a film that was supposed to be a prequel about aliens, right? Yeah. That's 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 the problem with Prometheus. And the thing is, Prometheus and Covenant have this wee thing with me where they just go on a bit longer than they should. Yeah. That's my only real qualm with them. But when the action starts in Covenant, I'm there for it. You know, because there's, there's actual tension. It's not like Aliens where there's like, the corridor scene where hundreds of aliens are coming up the corridor. Yeah. You know, it's like there's there's two Ninomorphs and you don't know where they are. And when they appear, they cause damage. That's that to me is what Alien was. You know, yeah. the the, t- the terror of not knowing. I mean I like a slow build, I won't lie. It's that way I get to know the characters a little bit. I like to know why they're there. I like to know what they're doing. And I hate when people say, oh, that's boring. And I'm just like, well, well no, it's exposition. It's like, yeah. it's better than just jumping straight into it. Like, it's kind of good to know the dynamic between all these characters initially in Covenant. It builds the relationships between all of them as well. Because obviously, you know, they're all couples uh, on the ship as well. So it does build up. And then little things that do get said in those beginning bits come back later on, like the log cabin and stuff like that. They're all very relevant. And I think the idea of Daniel's losing 
uh like james franco's character quite early on it's that way that it kind of pushes her to be who she is it sets her up to be yeah an angry character but very reserved yeah you know it's reserved anger and she's gonna use that to survive yeah regardless of what happens and you know that's exactly it's like i I think a slow build is good i think a slow build works i mean look at a film that's completely different like say suicide squad where all the characters are thrown at you in the first half an hour and you're expected to like them you know you're expected to understand where they're coming from nope whereas covenant does build up who yeah characters it's are. very much like alien it There's takes it takes a cue from alien it's that way it takes a slow it takes that kind of pace which is quite good because you kind of realize that if you're talking about the alien franchise and you're bringing ridley scott back to direct like two films they're going to be slow. I mean, it's that way that Alien is not a fast-paced movie. It's a slow build. Aliens is a fast-paced movie. Well, it's actually not. It because Aliens is on for way. like three hours. So it takes ages to kind of kick See, into it. But it's I'm pretty sure the first hour of oh, Aliens yeah. is really slow. But yeah. once it gets into it... Oh, yeah. Then all of a sudden it's kind of non-stop. But it's, that's why a lot of people didn't like Alien 3 initially. Because Alien 3 went back to that kind of being quite slow and being about character more than anything else. Yeah. The main thing that i want to get on here is you're we're saying about david being god and stuff what did you make of the little scene where the first xenomorph has broken out and he's standing there and he's like raising his arms and stuff like almost trying to get that connection yeah trying to kind of almost imprint something onto it but also in a kind of strangely weirdly crucifix pose as well yeah which i kind of noticed as well i kind of kept thinking am i over reading into this but no it totally did i like the idea that he was yeah he's he was kind of imprinting because then it yeah, obviously just ran away it didn't attack him and it's not the fact that we don't know that we know that aliens can kill synthetics because the bishop. bishop gets ripped in half so it's that way that I think it's, yeah, it's this way that he's, he definitely sees himself as this kind of Wayland figure over these xenomorphs. He believes he's controlling them and he believes they're there to serve him. It's, it's just, it is ego. It's complete ego. It's the fact that it's this idea that you become the person that you hate the most. And it's that idea that he hates his father for what he created. But at the end of the day, he's doing the exact same thing. Yeah, they are they are carrying out his work and yeah. going right for humans. So he's going, oh, I've done something right here. Yeah. But let's not forget the initial point. I mean, the ending of the film, you know, where he puts Daniels back into cryo sleep. Yeah. And he re- it's revealed he's David. And he puts the two embryos into a, a, a freeze chamber for, the yeah. for them. Let's not take away from what David's actual ploy is. He, like you say, he, he wants humanity gone. Yeah, you know, and he has something that's going to cause that, in his opinion. No, the point I think with David is that how Waylon treated him, Waylon put him in his place. Yeah, when he says, "I will outlive you, and you will die." Yeah, and Waylon didn't like that. Throw back to Prometheus when Prom- when that was all Waylon wanted yeah. was to to continue living. He didn't want to die. Yeah. So now you're at a point where that makes that scene in Prometheus more interesting. Yeah, totally. Because it's, it's like David says, you, I will outlive you, you'll die. Yeah. And then Wayland's just like, I have a chance now. Yeah. Like, make me a mortal, do this, do that. And <laughs> no. <laughs> like, yeah, because it's this idea that most people live on throughout, with, throughout their children. And it's that way that Wayland hates his children, pretty much. He sees them as nothing. So he just, he's, he, he's all ego himself. So it's, yeah, they're not very dissimilar characters. But yeah, it's, it's kind of building up to this whole thing. It also leaves a lot of questions because obviously now there's still technically 40 years between the end of Covenant and Alien. So obviously David's plans haven't come to fruition as well because if he's his end game is to end humanity, humanity has clearly not ended because then we've got Alien and you've got Aliens, which is set 57 years after. And then you've got Alien 3, which is set eight years after. And it keeps building on. So obviously... David's plan is a very slow build because it's going to last for the next 100 years. So humanity does live on still because Earth still exists. So obviously the next film has to discover what's going to happen with that because something has to happen to stop that, I think, personally. Well, I I think basically from what we've seen with uh, Alien Covenant that uh, the engineers have been taken care of so we don't see them ever again. Or have they? Well... Well, possibly. Maybe 
How cool was uh, it this... you saw the purpose of the ship, though? I kind of liked that they explained why the ship was shaped like that. Yeah. I did like that. I won't lie. It was, it was good. a kind of, like, it was this way for a reason, and it was just total fucking annihilation. Yeah. But it was also good that he used that to, well, exact his revenge on upon engineers. Yeah, and he obviously still has, well, that planet still has a great deal of those canisters still on it as well, because they saw them in the background of his workshed thing, basement, hit layer. Uh, Section. Yeah, that they were all in uh, on the walls. So he had still quite a few left over. And each of those things holds, if I remember right, holds eight of those vials. I, I'm mm. sadly that nerdy. Uh, so there's quite a lot of those. And I believe, did he not have one out? Did he take one yeah, out? Yeah, he had one of the vials he was shown. Yeah. So there's still loads of it. So whether that planet that they land on is LV426 or not, we're not too sure yet. What I think is going to happen in the next one, you, you made a good point with other engineers gone. That I think it's a safe bet that David's going to be ripped apart by his own creation. Yeah, I think that's the comeuppance, the ultimate comeuppance that he will get. And uh, if if not by a xenomorph, then perhaps by a remaining engineer that maybe saw this and managed to get away, and is maybe slowly chasing his way back to getting him. Yeah. Because I'm kind of thinking about it as well. If, if David's like if this, if he's like a, an android or a synthetic, uh, well, they don't want to be called androids, so synthetics. Uh, then surely, if he's owned by Wayland, Wayland Jutani, surely all this information is getting fed back to them. So surely they must be known this. Well, I would disagree because I don't think David is. I think he's still very synthetic, but his original body was destroyed. It's only sure. really everything artificial in his head that still goes. But that would effectively mean that most of everything that built up who David was from Wayland was destroyed when his head was ripped from his body. So th- 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 there's a potentially good Because the idea that Ash is obviously the next kind of evolution of David's. So it's that idea that Ash was working for Wayland Jatani completely. Bishop kind of is, but he's kind of got like his behavioral and habit or whatever they're called. Bishop, to me, from what I remember, is he sort of is more human because he, he, he it's like he comes across like he cares. Oh, he's got a beha- he's got a behavior something. I can't think what they call it. Behavior modulator or something modulator. that basically yeah stops him from doing harm or harming another. I don't know. I think I think just when I watch it, I'm like I know that he has that, but it feels like he genuinely does. Yeah. And but I then Bishop's supposed to be the person that created Bishop. So did Bishop create them all? There's so many questions. It's like Prometheus again. It's so many unanswered questions. It's it's a bit complicated. And so with the ending of the movie, we have many an- uh, questions answered from Prometheus and. St- stuff going in uh, where do you think this will lead do you think that the next movie will be the last of the alien franchise in in its totality or do you think something ni- like a uh, Neil Blomkamp's future Alien 5 that's going to strike 3 and 4 from the record book do you think that will happen uh, do you think that will eventually happen I don't think that will happen because I think I don't see because that would take a good few years for it to happen and I don't see Sigourney Weaver doing it I really don't I think where it's going next with this last film with Ridley Scott definitely he said I think he said there was a good at least another trilogy in it as well so it, that doesn't necessarily mean that this last film is going to be the end of that it could then lead on to another as I said there's 40 something years between now the, the a Covenant and Alien so they could tell the story kind of greatly. They've got a lot of time to do stuff. I think Ridley Scott's involvement will be done with his last film, definitely. And I think where it's going, I'm very curious about. Definitely, obviously, it'll, evolve, it'll be very David-heavy, I think. And it will also be, now the aliens are here, it's that way that it has to be about the evolution of the alien to what it is, pretty much, I think. I think it's all going to be about evolution, pretty much. Well... Does it ever explicitly state where they're going 
after they get back on the ship? The, uh, the ship is still technically programmed to go to this new place. No, this Seven was years. Yeah, so this was initially supposed to be... It's habitable. It's ha- the most yeah. habitable place for humans. Yeah. If David wants to... Impregnate kill. every single one of those people and then get them off the ship, and then they. This um, this is effectively the aliens' planet. Yeah, like you They're know, about to go. and it takes him seven years to get there. So if that's the case, for seven years he's going to be experimenting on these poor frozen people. Drops yeah. them off on this planet. People will then maybe come to that planet. You know, I don't. The only issue is that I don't know how they're going to explain because an alien, it's not the air is not breathable. Whereas in Aliens, it's only breathable because they put... Uh, like terraforming. The terraforming on it. So something will then have to happen to the planet for it not to be breathable again. They'll have to deal with that whole issue if they're going down that road. Um, but it definitely feels like that's where they're going with it because they have to explain. But then where is the like, spacecraft coming from? Because you have to get that engineer spacecraft back. So that has to link. Well, this is what I'm thinking. That engineer ship... Obviously, high uh, tech. Yeah. So he'll spend seven years experimenting, drop them off, let them do whatever. Seven years going back, getting the ship, and ha- you, you, we don't know. Is it going to take maybe days, weeks, months yeah. for the uh, the engineer ship to get to this new place? And that's where he creates. LV426 on this barren planet. Yeah. I like that idea. I like that idea. That would officially be him, to me, being God. Yeah. Would be dropping those o- th- those aliens off on that planet and then leaving. He's assuming that humanity's arrogance is going to take them out with to these planets, which it clearly is starting to do. So he'll assume that they'll visit these planets because he knows how arrogant man is. And the more the aliens of, yeah. kill, the more and the more planets produce. that he can inhabit with these aliens, the more there's more chance of humanity finding it. So I think maybe that's the idea that he's going from planet to planet and infecting it. I mean, the thing is, the Covenant ship itself is actually quite interesting. It's not like a ship you've really seen before, like you're saying about terraforming. Yeah. What if the ship is actually? Because that ship has to go somewhere. Realistically, when they get to that planet, they don't need that ship because they're supposed to stay there. So unless there's a serious emergency where they have to leave, what if the ship's a terraformer? Maybe. They mention in the movie that the planet that they end up going on has got the Xenomorph and Xenomorph and David is... Uh, yeah, just that, like cl- that, that clusterfuck. I would watch that sitcom. <laughs> Friends yeah. with aliens. Hey. Neil, Zio and David. <laughs> <laughs> I'd watch that. David, not again. Dad, what? <laughs> Sorry, kids. Just my genetic <laughs> experimentation. Uh, I would definitely watch that. Uh, yeah. Uh, basically, they're going to a planet that they know is going to be able to have human life on it. So I think it's more of a... Right, once it's done, this will maybe they'll, they'll land it and uh, bastardize the ship and like start up like energy and yeah. stuff from it so i think it's it doesn't have any of that stuff because it does have uh trucks on it which is well what they use to get rid of the last xenomorph yeah so they'll land it and they'll depart and enjoy their life i don't think the engineers are over yet because you think about it the engineer was driving that ship and its chest burst something came out of an engineer's chest and it didn't happen in prometheus so the engineers are not over yet. I think there's another. There's some more. They did say they sent out quite a few ships, in initially at the beginning. So I think David's going to try and hunt them down, uh, and he has to introduce. You have to see what's going to come out of that fa- that engineer's chest, which is going to be huge, if it adapts itself. So maybe that's the queen. Maybe. Maybe. Oof, maybe. I didn't think of that. Well, on that. Stuff on that devastating that note. devastating <laughs> revelation. I think we need to say goodbye. I think that's it. We're not going to rate the movie. How come oh. I know your podcast better than you? Rate the movie, James. <laughs> fuck's sake, twice. In fact, you do this all the time. No, but you, you rate it then. Yes. Say goodbye. Say goodbye. Baby. But just say goodbye to someone, then have a 10 minute conversation with them, then tell them to fuck off at your house. 
Okay, Chris, what did you rate this movie? I would give it. I'd. I'd give it a six, seven, because I love Prometheus. Ah. Uh. I would have to go with, because I love aliens, alien, and this, in that order, I'd have to go with a 7 on it, because it does play on the nostalgia factor, and it's yes, it's a little bit more friendly than what Prometheus was to me. Yeah. So, I find it more likeable in those aspects, James. If if you want to rate it, by the way, which <laughs> you're you're fully uh, yeah, inclined to want. not, you know, but uh, I'll I'll let you decide what the rating is for yourself. I don't know. I, I think I'd probably give it a five. If I rate the film for what it is on its own, taking away the fact that what it's trying to lead up to and what it has to live up to, give the film what it is for itself. You give it, I'd give it a five. It's it's not bad. I don't think it's revolutionary. It's not doing anything different. But it certainly did upgrade itself for Prometheus. Prometheus is a very talk-heavy piece, and there's very not little action, but there's not a lot. This one improves on that. Improves so it's on the, the Walter to David's Prometheus. Yes. There you go. This this film is Walter. So if there's a fucking third <laughs> David and Walter, then brilliant because the the next. Sounds like a really old gay couple, David and Walter. <laughs> it's like vicious, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> They're good um, pals, just good pals, David and Walter. Aye, aye, totally. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's 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 good for what it does. I just think it goes on a bit too long, and again, it leaves more questions than it answers. So and the music's awesome. And Can the music's talk about the music. The fact they use a whole alien score, which is fantastic, and then slightly bring in the Prometheus score, it is quite brilliant. I did love that. So, guys, I hope you all enjoyed that. I sure as hell did, and. Uh, Chris, do you want to do a sign off? I can put ge- the geek out. Oh no no, uh, the kind of like our Facebook, Facebook, oh, that, Twitter, oh, yeah. SoundCloud, like everything, uh, it's iTunes, on SoundCloud, and it's YouTube, like Facebook, like on Twitter, which is all Glasgow and Geeks, all one word, and comment suggestions. Yeah, and other things buy it on iTunes there's so many things <laughs> uh, audible.com there's lots of things we can promote <laughs> here uh, all that so do all those oh, do all those things that make us feel good yeah rate review is, uh, and subscribe on YouTube iTunes and SoundCloud and on that note on space uh, no one can hear you geek out